I love making beats for a living, but I also love having these conversations that I can share with the producer community. And I hope you've been enjoying the producer interviews I've been posting. And each one is different. That's that's the crazy thing. Whether you're selling beats online, whether you're getting placements, when you're, whether you're, you're doing all of the above, working with artists, getting uh, synchronization licenses, whatever it is, different producers are accomplishing all these things in very different ways. So this conversation with Monique Winning is especially unique because she's doing all of the above. She's selling beats. Uh, online licensing beats online she's not really using youtube though the way that most producers uh, tend to and she's also getting placements on, on major projects and so we talk about that and she's very honest and we also talk about mental health and that's a conversation that i'd like to see more of in the producer community and just in general but i think uh, we have some unique challenges as producers related to mental health and of course we talk about misogyny in the the producer community does it exist hell yeah it exists and having a young woman in the producer space share her opinions and her experiences it's just a great opportunity for all of us so so shout out to monique winning for having this conversation these conversations are live every monday and thursday at 3 p.m on beat stars it's a music entrepreneur club me and dame murder's online music business mentorship program hope you tune in live it's totally free enjoy the conversation peace let's be honest you're not gonna find these videos anywhere else why uh, because i make them so it would really help me out if you subscribe if you've already subscribed what also really helps is if you like the video and leave a comment it's hard in the era of clickbait videos on youtube and negativity in the producer community and i appreciate your support thank you so much one of your recent successes is, is going gold and, and so congratulations for that are you holding out for the platinum or have you already ordered the plaque well we're waiting for it to be we're waiting for it to be officially certified like right now just number wise it's gold but not like r-i-r-i-a-a -A, not yet so we're just waiting on that I, I didn't know until recently that you had to pay a bunch of money to the RIAA to, to, for them to run the numbers and certify the release. So, yeah, it takes some time, huh? Yeah. <laughs> but waiting. then again, I think everyone before getting into the industry thought that the plaques just got, you know, thrown to everybody for free. And then you realize, damn, I got to pay 350 for this. Come right. On. I've seen that. I was like, that is so whack. Like, you have to pay for your own reward, basically. So, yeah. 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 The RIAA is shaking everybody down. Um, so honest question. And that Bufo kind of asked this, but I really did have this written down. He had a he had a Bufo take on it and he's relating it to Charlie Sheen. Is there some kind of law of attraction element to your name? Um, no, not really. But I like how when I accomplish things like here comes all the puns. Everybody's like, oh, you're really winning or oh, your name. Makes sense. So, I don't know. I mean, I just be grinding. And then stuff aligns, and it's like, oh, okay. They think it makes sense. So. Well, how did you pick the name? Because obviously your name's not, you know, Monique struggling or Monique leaving. <laughs> so, yeah. Maybe there's something to that. I don't know. Well, okay. So, I got my name actually from my tag. Because when I had first started my producer journey or whatever, I was talking to my mom one day and I was like, oh my God, I got to have a cool tag. Everybody else has a cool tag. And I don't know. I think one day she quoted the movie Friday Night Lights. And one of the quotes from the movie is, if you want to win, put booby in or something. I, I don't, I've never seen the movie. But I think that's the quote. And so I was like, okay, I kind of like that. So I just put my own twist in it. And I think my tag at the time was, what was it? It was like, if y'all want to win, put Mo in. And so I put my usernames on social media, like Monique Winning or whatever. But I was originally going by my my full name, like my first name, Monique Diamond. Everybody knows me as that. So I was like, you know what? I want to have a cool name. Every, every other producer has a cool name that doesn't make sense. I want to have a cool name like that. So I was like, I'm going to just go with Monique Winning. And then, yeah, that's how that happened. As a, I'm glad you, you brought that up. So so. You had a conversation about your producer tag with your mother. Mm. How how has that kind of shaped your your journey towards music? Has has your family been supportive? Have, has your mother always been supportive of your pursuit of a career that really isn't traditional or necessarily seen as something viable? No, <laughs> honestly, no. Like 
she was always the type to where she's like, no, you're not going to treat that as a full-time job. You need to go get a real job and make, you know, real money, so to speak. So it wasn't until just recently where I've been able to treat this as like a full-time job. So she's still like, oh, okay, that's cool type of attitude towards things. But I feel like she's kind of getting the picture, kind of understanding that, yo, like this is real. Like this is what I'm really doing. It's probably going to take, I remember my mother was like that forever. Even after I, I was getting plaques and the number ones and stuff, it was Okay, yeah, that's great, but you know, there's a job opening of it. Like, yeah, <laughs> but I think it was, it was when I started getting um, covered in in local press, not even national, where I I feel like something in her eyes kind of changed, and she's like, right. oh yeah, that's my son, you know. <laughs> so I don't know what it's. Mothers are tough. Let's just let's just say that when it comes to to your career choices, it's, it's always going to be the mother that's. That's that's the the hurdle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely. Well, honestly, for me, it's really been my dad. He's more so like, no, you need to go to college. You need to go study this and this and then get this type of job. Like he's like not supportive of it at all. So. Oh, to this day. Yeah. Like, I swear, like when I had got the text that I had got the NLE top of placement, like, I was with my dad or whatever, and he's literally on the other side of me saying, I don't understand why you're doing that. I don't understand why you just won't go to college. And, like, the whole moment was just so bittersweet. Like, I'll never forget that. But, yeah, he's been the one that's more like, no, I don't want you doing that type of attitude. Oh, that's interesting. Um, so how, how long have you been making beats, and, and what made you start? So I've been making beats for, like, I think two and a half years now. Like not not any time long, like ten years or whatever. Like that's not me. It's only just been two and a half years for me. Um, but I've always been like music oriented. Like I've tried everything in reference to music, like dancing, singing, songwriting, rapping. I sucked at all of those. But the thing that made me start doing producing was I was just in love with the way music sounds in general. So I was like I want to learn how this is like, like what's the process behind music? So when I heard um, What a Time to Be Alive and just studied that album, that's when I became real in touch with the way production sounds. So then when I heard, what was it? Without Warning, that's when I was like, okay, I love the way Metro Woman did all of these beats. I want to learn how I can do this myself. And then from that point on, that's when I just started Trying stuff on GarageBand and just trying to make beats back then. So was that a special moment then when, when Metro retweeted you or had you already interacted with him on any level? He actually followed me on my last Twitter, but then I made a new Twitter. So I'm still trying to get him to follow me on that one. But everybody knows like Metro is like the main reason like why I started producing. He's like my main inspiration. So any interaction with him, I'm like, fangirling like oh my god like it's retro like i go crazy behind him yeah so that's that's one of the the hip-hop moments for monique winning um, yeah i love i love those i love when them when they happen and then i love seeing them happen to other people and kind of seeing how they how they react to it right uh i don't want to make assumptions what daw are you on and what are some of your favorite plugins um i use fl studio um, my favorite plugins, I really like Arcade. Um, I used to love Atmosphere, but like as I started just making more very, very trap beats, I was like, okay, I didn't, I started gravitating away from Atmosphere because I was like, it felt like it was just more so melodic versus like some real street trap stuff. So I say Arcade, Expand 2. And sometimes contact. Sometimes. See, I just because Expand Two was on sale, so I just started using it. And it's funny because someone in the chat named Angel Ray Beats is saying, "I love Arcade," but <laughs> she was she had a lot to say about me discovering Expand Two for the first time. So we're not going to go there. But shout out to her. <laughs> uh, so okay, Light Skin Keisha, NLE Chopper, T, T Grizzly. Um, these are just a few artists that you have production credits with. 
What are the name? I know some people are asking too. What are the names of some of the songs you produced recently for these artists? Um, well, not T Grizzly, just NLE Choppa, Light Skin Keisha, and Jack Boy. Um, the Depression one with NLE Choppa, Top Me with Light Skin Keisha, and The World Is Yours with Jack Boy. Oh, my bad. Am I mistaken about the T Grizzly thing? That was a whole situation where there was multiple beats, some beats didn't get used, some versions of the beats didn't get used. So I just moved on from that one, and yeah. <laughs> Okay, fair enough. Okay, so Depression by Anna Lee Chapa, and then um, what was the Light Skin Keisha song? Top Me? Top Me. You said? What is it called? Top Me. Okay. Okay, so I can already imagine what that song's about. Um, she, <laughs> no, she's, not that. Not that. <laughs> I, I actually have been listening to a lot of Light Skin Keisha lately, um, and I, I, like, I like the music. I like the beats, too. They're really energetic and um percussion heavy where right. you really have to your your drum game has to be on 120 percent to get a record with her yeah i'll agree so but it's what, funny though because like with that album like most of the beats on that album are just more so like they have a different vibe they're like how can i put it they're like very energetic, as you said, and they're like kind of light in a way. Mm -hmm. But like the one that I did is like the only one that's like a dark kind of trap beat. So I thought that was kind of interesting how that one beat is so different and the rest are like a certain type of vibe. So shout out to her for picking that beat. Yeah, I know what you mean because because her other even her singles that she that she had videos to um, that I that I saw, the mm -hmm. even the mixes were really interesting where it like you said it was light and the instrumentation was mixed really subtly mm -hmm. and I, I just it's it's just so interesting how much variation there is nowadays between i think people think that that especially the the modern day kind of trap music is real monolithic but there's a lot of subtle variation between the two um how, how did that placement happen with her um i believe she had a studio test studio session one day and people were just playing my beats for her and then she heard the beat and she was like yeah I don't know what I think she was like yeah let's let's record or something so it made her get hyped so she just started recording to it that's so vague what what people were playing beats and how did they have your beats um I believe some of her a and R's like I sent packs with my guy Lucas I sent packs to him and he's like one of the guys who like kind of work closely with her or whatever so he just always has my beats or whatever so he picked out a certain few of my beats for her and then i believe he just played them for her and then she really liked that one beat and that was is she on empire or is she on a, a different label um i don't know i think she's with stream cut i believe okay hmm. yeah again there's just so much <laughs> going on within the the modern day music landscape not just right. with producers but with artists there's just so many options now it's really cool to see um so was that your first placement or what was your what was your first ever major placement my first one was the nle top one okay how did how did that happen so with that that was more so of just a couple of people allowing me to be a part of this major song or whatever and just allowing me to just really be in the moment of seeing what actually happens when it comes to getting your, like, your first major placement or whatever. And it's kind of crazy because my first placement was about depression and I myself suffered from depression for like a couple years or whatever. So just that one placement itself and that being my first placement, it was just real sentimental to me. So that was a real special moment. So was that, was that a collaboration between you and other producers? Yeah. How many other producers? I believe it was like three other ones. It was like two guys on the melody and then my dude Golden, he did some of the drums as well. And so that's how that worked. Got it. And then mm -hmm. uh, there's a, it's a good question that someone just asked. Um, how did you get in contact with the A&R 
I, and you know, th that's a larger conversation about networking within the music business. So if you want to provide any insight into into your overall networking experiences, that'd be great too. Mm -hmm. So with that, it wasn't really me getting into contact with people. It was more so uh, someone else had like a bigger hand in what was going on. And he was just allowing me to do and put my little parts into the project itself or whatever. And so that's just how that happened. But with other A&Rs, honestly, I don't really work with like a lot of A&Rs or whatever. There's some A&Rs that I'll notice like on Instagram and I'll just DM them like, hey, can I send you beats for such and such artist or whatever? And then they'll be like, yeah. And then they'll just give me their email or they'll give me their phone number. So that works for me. That's how I go about some things. I feel like that's kind of just how we expect things to work. There are a lot of weird situations out there where people are people are ARs and they're charging mm -hmm. for beat submissions or they're charging for placements that kind of thing i'm sure you've seen that what what made you stay away from from those kinds of scenarios honestly i feel like you can kind of tell like who's like really in tune with such and such artists or whatever and so when i go to people's accounts and profiles and stuff like that that's mainly what i look for like okay are you really in tune with this artist? Like, are you really doing stuff with them? And if they appear to be that way, or if they have like other major A and R's following following them or whatever, that kind of helps me believe that like, their credibility. So that makes me want to reach out to them. So, so back to the depression placement. Um, how how did that even work? I mean, were you a part of the process from from the very beginning, or or did this beat? It's, uh, you know, did the producer start creating the beat and then say, okay, we really need Monique on the drums because these drums aren't, are not working. So with that, it was more, because he actually had recorded that song to another beat. I believe it was the Billie Eilish Temple. And so I don't know what happened, but they didn't clear that beat supposedly. So their people, and Ali Chapa's people, hit my guy, my guy Lucas, who's like, had like the main hand in what was going on. So they hit him for another replica of the beat, kind of, sort of. And so that's when everybody just started saying, okay, let's do this and this. Let's do the beat like this type of stuff. And so that's how that worked. So it was, like, real complicated. We didn't know if they were going to choose the beat or if they were going to choose somebody else's beat. Like, we didn't know how it was going to turn out. So we honestly just got kind of lucky that he chose our version of the beat. And so that's how that came about. So I know you, you mentioned that this song had a lot of meaning to you uh, based on your own experience with, with depression. I, I feel like, and I have these conversations a lot. Um, sometimes they're public. I know, in my opinion, these, these conversations don't happen enough. But, for example, Curtis King talks a lot about mental health in the producer community. Um, and I wish he weren't the exception. I wish you know more people had those conversations. But... Mm -hmm. <sighs> What has, has been your experience in the producer landscape keeping your mental health in mind? Um, I don't even know. Like, now what I do, like, if I feel myself, because honestly, I'm a real spiritual person. Like, before when I was dealing with depression or whatever, like, I wasn't so spiritual. But the fact that I'm so spiritual now, it just, and plus because of the way the world is today, it's like, I know that I have a million and one reasons to be happy. Like just seeing like with how, how many people die with this disease and stuff like that. So really what helps me just keep my mental health good is just being reminded of how grateful I am for what I have and what I know is to come. You know, I just keep that reminder in my head every day. I feel myself getting sad or whatever. And that just helps me stay afloat. I read that recently. I don't know if it was a, like Buddhist teaching or something, but s something to the effect that the person with gratitude can never f feel depressed or can never mm -hmm. feel sadness, something like that. Um, so I've actually, that what you just said is something I've really been trying to focus on lately. Mm -hmm. um, I, I recently read, read a tweet from you that said you almost joined the Air Force. Oh my God, yes. I did, like right before COVID happened, I was like, cause once again, I was having the pressure of, okay, should I stick with this producer journey? And because I know I believe in myself or 
should I just be pessimistic and just do something that's a real world type of stuff? Because, you know, I had my mom in one ear telling me, you need to figure out what you're going to do. Da, 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 da. Then I had my dad in another ear telling me, you need to figure out what you're going to do because I don't want you doing that. So I was like, you know what? I'm just going to go to the Air Force. So then that COVID disease happened or whatever. And that made me take a step back and say, uh, I don't know if I want to join the Air Force. So that's how that happened. So I just started back because beforehand I had took a break from producing or whatever, just to focus on like real life. Cause at one point I was like, how am I going to try to chase my dreams or whatever and worry about my future? If my present is so messed up, like I can't even deal with my present. So I just tried to just focus on real life, figure out what I was going to do. So I wasn't producing. Oh my God, keeps texting me. So I wasn't producing. So now looking back, it's like if COVID didn't happen, I probably would have went to the Air Force. May I ask why the Air Force? All, out of all of the options, was that kind of a family tradition? Or was that something that you chose? No, honestly, it seemed like it was the easiest. So when it comes to like the physical training, so that's why I chose that one. Uh. So how did you get to the point where you, you committed to just production, given all of the obstacles and all of the expectations? What kind of work, you know, mental work uh, did you have to do to really resist the path, resist the current of what was expected of you? Really, honestly, um, Around May, I had this sales job for Spectrum. So I was like the salesperson or whatever. But the thing, the shift in my life that made me say, I'm just going to do producing full time was when I had gotten into this car accident or whatever. So my mom seen how traumatic it was for me or whatever. And so I told her, I'm like, look, because the sales job I had is the type of job where you have to drive around door to door or whatever. So the vehicle I was in got completely totaled or whatever. So my mom just understood like the situation itself and just how traumatic it was for me. So I told her, I was like, Hey, I'm not going to go back and work that job and just drive around like normal. Cause that was like my first, um, major car accident. So I was like, I'm not going to do that. And so I was telling her, I was like, this is what I'm going to do. This is cause at the time when that accident had happened for me, my B stars kind of started going crazy. Like I started getting like a bunch of sales just out of nowhere. I started getting a bunch of sales. And just, just things like that. So I was telling her like, look, like, oh my God, like, look, I'm making this much money. Like understand, like this could be like a real job, like just believe in what I'm doing. And so she eventually started to come around like, okay, if you want to do that, go ahead and do that. So that's how that happened. You were, you said you were working for Spectrum as in the, um, the, the data company, the cable company. I don't know if it's like, yeah, the cable company. Yeah, I used them. My internet was down this morning. <laughs> yes, mine too. That's crazy. That's so crazy. Um, no, it's not actually up here. It's down every every other week, and it's always on days where I'm like, I got to do a podcast. I gotta right. Interview Monique. Why is this happening now, Spectrum? Why? Um, I swear, <laughs> I was trying to watch Disney Plus last night, and it just would not work. So I gave up. Well, it was it was storming here, so like anytime there's a raindrop, there's always a risk of everything going haywire. I don't know if you had inclement weather yeah. down there. <laughs> Sometimes, not too much in Texas though. It's just always hot. Well, yeah, I guess it's Texas is approaching their version of winter, so weather does. Ch- I've been there. I've been there in winter, and I'm like, that's like our spring. But yeah, right. Um, <laughs> It's horrible. Like it's still like we're almost in what? We're in fall technically and it's like 90 degrees outside right now. Like it's horrible. Yeah, I have some close friends who live out there. I have one friend that lives out there and she's always giving me the report, but she's from out here, so it's just a are you were you born and raised in Texas? Yeah. Okay, so you don't you don't know how hellish it is in the Midwest. Okay, cool. Or the East Coast. Shout out to everyone in New yeah. York. They, they suffer very similarly to the way we suffer in, in the Midwest. Um, at, so at this point in, in, in your life, you're making a living 100% off music. You're, you're not working side jobs or are you still kind of transitioning? No, it's just all just music. 
how long did it take you to get to that point from the from the moment you really committed to present day? Well, I've always tried to be like fully committed. Like even last year when I just kept having this ongoing battle with my mom, like, look, I don't want to work this job. Like, why can't you just believe in what I want to do? Because it, I can really treat it as a full time job and make consistent money or whatever. And the whole time she's just like, no, 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 you're not doing that. Like we would just keep getting into arguments because she's just like, no, you're not doing that. Like you're going to work a full job like me, work a normal job like me and make real money because I need because her in her defense is more so of she needs help, which I understand that. So she's like, I need help. I need to make sure that you're going to be making money every month so you can help around the house. So that was understandable. Yeah. So it wasn't until this accident happened to where she just really understood, like, look, she's not doing that. Let her just do what she wants to do and just move on. So, did yeah. you did you save a lot of money from that job and then slowly transition? Or was it just kind of like, here we go. Let's just do it. Well, from the job that I was working last year, I did save a lot of money. And then I turned around and spent that money on some equipment or whatever. So that was that. So yeah, I spent some of it on equipment. So. Well, I mean, that's a, that's a write off. Yeah. That's I didn't know off. that until this year. So I didn't do that. I wonder if you can, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know I, how that works. So. I'm, I'm trying to have a CPA on. Um, Cause yeah, when I, when I switched over to having someone else do my taxes, was like a whole new world. I'm like, wow, I can right. I can write that off, and I'm so I'm so it, it's it's expensive, but it's worth it just because. Well, one, I don't know how you are. I'm terrible with math, so me sitting down in front of, you know, tax documents, like I would at this point, I would just cry, mm. and then I'd end, up, <laughs> I'd end up I'd be like Wesley Snipes. I'd be in prison because I just give right. Um, that's not funny. He actually to go to prison for tax evasion. I think a lot of people do that because, you know, it's just, it doesn't feel that serious. And I think a lot of producers don't look at, you know, because it's like, I don't know if you ever have these moments where you wake up and you realize you're making music and that's your job. And you're like, how yeah. did this happen? <laughs> like, it doesn't feel real, you know? And so I, I feel like um, just that, that kind of, there's like a barrier between a really amazing job, like making music and then our perceptions of what making a livelihood is supposed to look like. So we might not conceptualize it as a legitimate business in our brains, even though we're actually doing it for a living, you know what I mean? And so that might prevent us from taking the necessary measures to, you know, file our taxes or, or keep a tax diary, that kind of thing. Right. Honestly, I, I haven't been doing that. Maybe I should. <laughs> uh, yeah, because you'd be surprised, you know, what what you put it. And now it's different with, with COVID. But, you know, if you're buying plugins and stuff, you, yeah, write, write those off because that money comes back to you. So how does it work? Is it like a form or something that you have to have? Um, no, work? if you file, I sh I'm the last per disclaimer. I'm the last person that should be giving advice. I really want to have a CPA, um, <laughs> but I, I would say number one, I'd encourage everyone to talk to a certified public accountant and not listen to DJ Payne one. Uh, but for me, I'm just keeping track of everything, and then and I itemize it. You know, I, I purchased this on such and such a date for such and such an amount. I'm keeping the receipt in a folder, uh, and at the end of the year, I report it on my taxes mm -hmm. that this was a business expense. You know, this, this camera that I use for my videos cost $700. This plug-in cost a hundred, you know, that kind of thing. And, um, you know, some of that money gets deducted from the overall taxes that you owe. And right. yeah, so TikTok, yeah, uh, she's, she's saying, wait, TikTok says, um, he writes off his home studio. So there's that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, like I work from home too. So, um, your housing expenses and certain utilities, I think, can be can be uh, partially deducted from that. But again, I'm the last person that should be talking about this. I'm just encouraging everybody to look into it, and you can you know save some money. But um, and mm -hmm. to answer, I, do you have an LLC? I finally just registered one. Um, no, 
I don't think I do. I think a lot of people think you need one. Again, this is let me let me stop fielding questions that are related to you know business matters and and mm-hmm. corporation and all that. But um, I know I know this that you can certainly uh, work as a sole proprietor without the LLC. There are just that's what certain, I think. I, yeah. I think it's that kind of thing. Yeah, I think LLC offers some protections um, to. Mm-hmm. What ex- I actually just got a letter in the mail. I have to file my annual LLC report. It's not that difficult. So if people want to do that, um, that's another thing that that your CPA can help you with. Uh, so back back to you and your career. What are some of the sacrifices you've had to make to <laughs> really make this stuff work? Oh my god! Like the list is so long, yo. <laughs> like okay, basically. Well, the sacrifice, one of the sacrifice I made was just kind of the relationships that I have with my parents that, that I believe that was a sacrifice. Cause like now, honestly, I don't really talk to my dad that much because of his lack of belief in what I'm doing. So I believe that's kind of a sacrifice. Um, I've, I don't know if I could put it as a sacrifice. Just, just putting myself in positions to where I have to continuously just believe that everything is going to work out in my favor or just taking those leaps of faith, not knowing what's going to happen on the other side. Or like when I go travel places, just off the strength of what people tell me, like, Hey, come out here. We're going to do this, this and this for you. It's going to be good. I'm going to make sure you're good. Da, 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 da. And then I go out there and nothing happens. Just stuff like that. I've been through a lot of things like that. Um, I believe those are sacrifices to me because it's like I'm sacrificing money that I'm hardly making like at the time. So that was a big one for me. Um, those are really just the main sacrifices I believe that I've been through so far. Yeah. I mean, I hear what you're saying. It's, it sounds like you're saying that the, one of the biggest sacrifices is the sacrifice of comfort mm. and predictability. Cause there's nothing predictable about being your own business, especially when your business is music. Right. And so faith in yourself is huge. I, I think that's probably, and I, I don't know if you came up with a lot of people who were also trying to make music, um, but you, you'll, you'll see, and you've probably already seen how many of them are just kind of fear driven and they let that, that fear and uncertainty prevent them from fully committing. Mm-hmm. So uh, Cloud9 Music asks, what are your hardest tasks throughout the week? Um, I don't know. Like, I honestly do like the same stuff almost every day. Kind of the same stuff almost every day. My hardest task, believe it or not, is getting started. Because sometimes I'll be like, eh, I don't feel like it today. And I'll just waste the whole day. So I really try to shy away from doing that. So really, my hardest task is opening up my laptop and getting started. Yeah. What are some ways that you find inspiration? I know beat block is one of those topics that's always going to come up. How, how do you, how have you figured out how to deal with that? If, if you have. Well, usually when I have beat block, I honestly just try to spend the day doing something else other than making beats. Like I'll try to spend the day just doing something that's productive and something that can help me for the next day for when I try to make beats. So that usually works for me. That's usually how I go about it. Like I'll try to arrange my files in my computer or I'll try to um, upload new beats to beat stars or I'll just try to listen to new music, study what's hot, just things like that. That usually works for me. So what is ideally, you know, without the beat block, what is what is a typical work day for Monique winning? Um, I don't know. Wake up, eat breakfast with my mom. Play with my dog, take my dog outside, um, figure out what kind of beats I want to make today, um, take a shower, eat, and then do it all the next day. That's usually how my days go. So shifting gears, um, I would, obviously before COVID, um, Mm -hmm. I'd hope be making sessions in the public schools out here. 
uh, through, through my nonprofit and other organizations. And lots of the young girls in the classrooms were super energized and engaged when it came to making beats. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and like to a very high degree. Uh, but you don't really see many teenage girls or adult women continue pursuing production. Why do you think that is? Um, honestly, I, I would say maybe that they get discouraged by how many female producers actually get to where they're reaching a go. I feel like that's one of the main things. Because honestly, before stuff started aligning and happening for me, I was kind of discouraged. I was just like, man, I don't know if I'm ever you know, start doing what I'm trying to do. Like, I don't know if things will ever happen for me. I, I was that girl. I'm not going to sit here and pretend like, yeah, I always knew it was going to work like this. Like, I was discouraged sometimes, too, just by um, the possibility of things never happening quick enough for me. So I believe that's kind of probably one of the main things that discourages f young females. So just not seeing women that are visible in that mm -hmm. world is, is discouraging right. Yeah, because I feel like so I mean there are some very un underrated here so unsung heroes in production and I think Missy Elliott is one of them but mm -hmm. a lot of people don't bring up her right. really right. successful career it's like yeah Missy Elliott is an artist she did work it she she mm -hmm. she had a hook that was all backwards. That's that's Missy Elliott's career. It's like, nah, she was a songwriter. She was a producer, mm -hmm. and a, and a successful artist. So, I, I yeah. And there are more people than just her. More more women in production. But what do you think needs to change in the music business or the producer community or the world at large to facilitate yeah. uh, more women getting involved in beat making and production careers? Um. I don't know. Okay. Um, I feel like, okay. I was just thinking about this yesterday. I feel like, okay, you know, there's like a few female producers, you know, like a few of them, right? So, but like, I'm gonna just, I'm gonna just compare like female producers to my producers in the industry. Like, I'm not saying I'm in the industry, but I'm just going to compare what I see. So you see like the female producers. Wait, no, no, you're in the industry. You're in the industry. Okay. Just, I mean, I don't like Let's just get that clear. Part. Okay. Okay. I'm going to include myself in it too. Okay. So you see the male producers who are just even on the upcoming or just male producers in the industry in general. A lot of them all work with each other. They're like, oh, okay, you're doing this. Let's work together. Let's connect. Let's go do this. But I feel like, and I could be wrong, but I feel like the female producers are just all like doing their own thing. Like you have one here, you have one here, you have one here, you have one here. I feel like if some of the female producers were just more so would just more so interact with each other and try to connect and network and just, I don't know, just try to work with each other. I feel like that would increase the number of just how many female producers are in the game itself and just increase the visibility of female producers in general. Um, that's just what I think. I mean, some of them may honestly be working with each other. I don't know. But just what I think, I just think lack of the interaction creates that kind of look to where there's like some here, there's one here, there's one here. You know what I mean? That's what I yeah, do you think it's because there's so few of them that there's just more isolation and, and maybe there are outside forces that kind of impose this unhealthy competition on them? Like, you're a female producer. Um, there aren't very many of you. You need mm -hmm. to be you need to be by yourself. You got to compete with all the other women in that same space. Cause I feel like that happens with, with, um, women in, in rap music. You see a lot of, and I've seen it. Um, I used to work with some rappers, some gay rappers, and I saw mm -hmm. it there where it's like, you're a minority in this larger space. And then mm -hmm. all of a sudden everyone's beefing. And I'm like, why? It was kind of right. like, you know, why was Lil Kim beefing with, um, Nicki Minaj? Oh my think? God. <laughs> I knew he was going to go there. But I feel like with female rap is different because it's it's public. Like, you you see female rappers, but you don't see a lot of the female producers because they're like just, some of them just like to be behind the scenes. And you have some who like to have their brand as as their, their personality and what they're doing. Some just want their beats to be their brand. Like with me, I, I want myself, my personality, my looks, my beats, 
that's my brand. Like, you know me, you see me, you know how I look, stuff like that. But there's some producers where you don't know if it's a, if it's a guy or a girl because they just don't like to show their face. So I don't know. It just, it's weird. I don't know. Well, I, I interviewed, um, Neon Vines, who's also in Texas. She's a woman in the production space. And mm -hmm. I posted that video to YouTube, got a bunch of comments. Um, one of the comments was from a man and it reads, this has everything to do with the male ego. I've been making music and going to countless studios. In my experience, it's the same thing that happens. Female makes beats. Guy says, oh, that's nice. You're cute. Will let me in if you expletive, basically. And I mm -hmm. absolutely get why they're frustrated or even hesitant to pursue this career. It sucks. And it's the kind of, he's describing the kind of predatory behavior that Cricket I recently called out. Um, in a series of posts about misogyny in the music business. And I've certainly seen, I mean, you even look at the producer memes and you know they're made by men because a lot of times they're objectifying or they're sexist or whatever. And there's that whole joke about why aren't there more female producers because they don't use logic or reason. And ha, 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 we've heard it a million times. So has that been your experience that the that the producer culture is also leaning towards misogyny? Um. Yes, in a way. And I'm honestly going to touch on that topic of where there's some famous rappers who follow me, who know me and things like that. But I'll be like, let me send you beats. Da, 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 da. And they're more so like, no, don't send me beats, but you're cute, though. Let me fly you out. I I've gotten that. I've definitely gotten that. So that is <laughs> that is stuff that I've dealt with personally. Um I've been in a few studio sessions as to where um, I'll be playing beats or whatever and like the rappers or whatever, they'll look at me and they're like, oh, you made this beat? You, you too cute to be making beats. What are you doing? Or whatever. So, and then within like the online producer community, I will say it's misogynistic as hell. Can I curse? As hell. Um, like I remember seeing this You one can use stronger language than that because <laughs> this stuff honestly makes me sick. Someone said... uh we can say this. This shit is so disgusting because it is. It really yeah. can be. Yeah, I remember seeing one tweet where this one producer, he was like, what did he say? He was like, what did he say? He was like, um, other producers see another female producer and they go crazy over her just because she's cute. I'm like, so you're mad because a female producer is getting support? Like, it's just some, you have some male producers who will literally hate on female producers because of the support that they're getting, which is, I feel like, like me, I feel like I get genuine support. Like there's so many producers who genuinely just want to work with me, just want to link up with me, be friends with me, whatever. Like I, I genuinely have, you know, just real support from other producers. So it's just crazy what, just what other producers say sometimes. Like, Yeah. I mean, as someone who gets a ton of support and a ton of hate on the internet, I can say that that my support and my hate have never been due to my appearance or no one's ever phrased it as such. You know, there, there's all types of hate in the in the producer community. And someone could say, yeah, you know, well, women just got to deal with it. But it's it's different. It's very mm -hmm. different. Um, and, and, you know, when I when I interview male producers, no one's in the comments saying, oh, the only reason anyone cares is because he's sexy. Like mm -hmm. no one. And. It doesn't even come up. Um, another woman commented, and I like her comment. She said, I know so many female producers that just don't feel the producer culture. They f they want in, but they're not comfortable enough to take part. What, what are some ways that we, whether we're men, whether we're women, whoever, uh, change the producer culture for the better? What are some, some things that you think we, we really could focus on to really start that process of changing it from within out um <laughs> oh my god like the list goes on like right now i feel like the the culture is actually pretty toxic i feel like you have a couple of producers and i'm not saying this as like a diss but you have certain producers who aren't happy with themselves so they'll see other people winning and then they just start trolling and spewing hate at them for no reason, just because no pun intended, but they're winning. You know what I mean? So 
It's a lot of that. And like, that's just people, that's what in any career field. So I definitely understand that. But I don't know. I just feel like, honestly, I don't even know. I don't even know how to answer that question because I feel like it's just all, it's just all related to self. Like you have other producers who just would rather, like I said before, would just rather be known for trolling and just saying ignorant stuff on Twitter instead of being known for being a hard producer. Like it just, I think that kind of just makes the community like one big laughing stop. Like there's no seriousness in it in a way. Like I get having fun, da da da. It's just the internet, you know, want to tell a joke, ha, ah, okay, cool. But it's like the ratio to people who are actually putting in work and, and are actually like taking this seriously, I feel like it's just kind of low. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I don't know. It just, it's a yeah. lot. I've I've had these conversations where, and I feel like the internet just and the anonymity of the internet just allowed this kind of troll culture to mm-hmm. infiltrate everything. And it's and I the same thing that you just said. I feel the same way in the producer community, and it's ironic too because I feel like now, I mean, B stars just hit that hundred million dollar mark paying out producers. That's amazing. Twenty years right. ago, we could have never predicted this. You know what I mean? And mm-hmm. so producers and and could we you know your tweet about metro booming going platinum off a solo album a producer solo album going platinum that that's another thing to celebrate um, right you know internet money's on top 10 and it's a producer collective mm-hmm. there are so many things to celebrate in the producer community right now yeah. and ironically i feel like we're always at or, or right now we're at this this moment where there's just a, a, a high amount of like you said of just not necessarily even trolls but like the demotivational speakers that Mm -hmm. claim everything's wrong and then everyone's lying and everyone's cheating and minimizing everyone's accomplishments or just living to derail any any positive conversation that's happening um it's and it's weird and i i don't honestly know why that's happening right now um Mm -hmm. Maybe it's just a critical mass of of too many producers. I don't know. Like I, I really just feel like just just because of like the way the world is today, you know, with the COVID disease and people losing their jobs and people losing their homes and people losing loved ones and stuff like that. I feel like depression mm-hmm. within people are at a halt is at an all time high right now, and I feel like a lot of people are depressed and they see other people just get into it, you know chasing their dreams, whatever, whatever, accomplishing things. And they see that and they're just, they're just kind of like jealous in a way. Like, oh, you did that. That's not even a big deal. Like, I'm going to troll you and bring in my other friends so they can troll you some more. And, you know, just just minimize your accomplishment. Like with internet money, the amount of hate internet money gets is so crazy. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know. I really just feel like it's just all jealousy. Yeah. Um, and you're, I, I think you hit the nail on the head. Jealousy is a is a symptom of insecurity and depression, and mm-hmm. there's a lot going on with the mental health. Um, and yeah, you're right. I think I don't think I think they they've done research on this with COVID and isolation and all of this. It's mm-hmm. just skyrocketed, and right. if it was bad already. It's 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 really bad now. Uh, okay, let's talk about something a little positive. Um, <laughs> yeah. And then we'll get back into the kind of problematic questions. Um, your your kick and your bass hit super hard in your mixes. What are what are some tips that you can give producers like myself that are trying to achieve that same sound while keeping the the beat clean? Really, it's all just like leveling in a way. Like the way I level my beats is to where my kick. I want to say is the loudest thing. My kick is the loudest thing. And then I may be lying. I, I, I'm trying to go off memory, but my kick is the li- kick is the loudest thing. Um, clap, and then and then I, I switched it up because it used to be my kick, clap, and then the 808, and then and then the other drums, and then the melody. But I switched it up. I've done like the kick, clap. The melody, no, kick, clap, other drums, the melody, and then the 808. Because I've noticed, like, in some of the popular songs or whatever, the 808 isn't that loud. Like, the main thing that's kind of, like, really, really loud is just the melody, the clap, and the kick. 
That's what I've noticed. So I've just been trying to like follow that kind of pattern, whatever, especially with getting new placements and stuff like that. So that's what I do now. So, and you don't do any kind of clipping, soft clipping, side chaining, any, any super technical tricks? It's really just gain staging? Um, I believe I do soft clipper on my 808 sometimes. Like, I save my own mixer presets, honestly. So, I don't do like everything each beat. So, I just That's smart. Pick on my, my, uh, my preset for a certain 808 and then boom. But I think I do the soft clipper for my 808. Um, like I don't use a whole bunch of plugins and compression. I don't. I don't do all that. I just. I just use like good 808 samples. Like I don't pick the most trash 808 samples and try to tweak them. No, I'm not gonna do that. So, so yeah, I just do the fruity soft clipper, and then on my master, I think I soft clip my master as well. I don't know. And then I use this plugin called I use Ozone Five on my master. There's like this preset. To where it turns the beat up basically, and I believe it boosts some of the the bass. So that's really just all I do. So, so you heard it here first. Don't <laughs> use trash 808s. Um, yeah. To to build on that, are there any specific kits that you that you do use? Um, really, I think I only use Cody's Reddit drum kit. I believe that's the only kit that I use. That's the main one. I'm sure I use like other little sounds from other kids, but that's like the main um, kit that I use. His Space Cadet kit is pretty good too. Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay, so a lot of the or some of the some of the recent placements you've gotten um, were collab uh, situations mm-hmm. with other producers. A lot of producers don't trust collaborations, and and a lot of them i mean producers are, are really afraid of a lot of things getting their beats stolen period mm-hmm. in general but i've every time this topic comes up you hear about producers distrusting a collaborative scenario because they think people are just out to steal their ideas or mm-hmm. you hear horror stories about people not agreeing on splits that kind of thing for you what did it take for you to trust your your collaborators honestly and everybody knows this um, my weakest point is I'm not the best melody maker. So once I realized that, I was like, and people just were sending me loops and stuff like that. They had crazy loops, crazy good sounds or whatever. Like I would hear their loops and I'd instantly get inspired to make a beat. I was like, I could just use other people's stuff when they send me stuff and that's how we can collab. And it's just so simple. Boom. Like, cause I'm not going to sit here. Cause with me, I'm all about efficiency and time. So I'm like, I'm not going to sit here and try to force like a hard, super good melody for like 45 minutes when I could just use a loop that someone sent me and I can make a beat in 45 minutes. You know what I mean? So that just works for me. I'm all about efficiency. Okay. I got to send you more samples. Um, So your beats are really current sounding. And I'd say some of the best current rappers like like the Polo G's or the Broad Waves mm-hmm. are, are making what I've heard people call, call pain music. Mm-hmm. Um, how do you make sure that your beats convey emotion? Because they really do. Um, I don't know. Like, I know with certain style of beats, there's, like, certain instruments. And, like, it needs to sound a certain way. Like, I'm all about studying what's hot. Like, that's all I do. So, I know, like, if I make... Um, I'm going to use Rod Wave. I know if I make a Rod Wave beat, like the melody itself has to have some kind of vocal chop or something or a piano or guitar, you know, like I'm just, I just know like what needs to have certain elements. So that kind of helps with that conveying a certain image (laughs) within the beat. Mm. So with regard to, to these collaborations and what what kind of experience did you have negotiating splits in these scenarios especially when there's a placement like a like an NLE chop placement um well just recently I don't know if I should talk about it well just recently I had an issue well I wouldn't say it was an issue but I had a beat I believe it got placed with with a certain artist or whatever and it was three producers on the beat. It was me and two other guys. But um, this guy, this producer, he had sent me his, his loop kit. So I was like, okay, cool. This was like last year, I think. 
what was it this year? I don't know. It was a few months ago. So he sent me his loop kit and there was two producers on like each of the loops. So I'm like, okay, I guess so. The loops still sounded good. So like I just used them like whatever, not a big deal. So months later, I, I make a beat to their loops. I, I, I send that beat out. I'm trying to get that beat placed. Da, 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 da. So then the beat gets placed or whatever. And when it came time to do the split, it was a situation where they didn't agree on the split. They felt like it was too low. But in my defense, they were trying to say, well, she did like the most work in, in, in regards to actually making the beat, sending the beat and getting it placed. So that's why they wanted my percentage to be higher. So it was just more so I've ran into that kind of situation so far. But other than that, everything's been pretty smooth so far. That did was that like situation, the sorry, did, did that situation get resolved? Yeah. <laughs> okay. But like yeah. now yeah. I know like future wise, like, okay, when there's two producers on the loop, kind of be skeptical of like, you know, how they try to play it, stuff like that. Oh, I see what you're saying. If it's two producers on the loop, they might mm -hmm. want like an even three-way split. Even right. though, I, right. I, I, yeah, I see how that can get really confusing because I, I, I can see a scenario in which there would be an even 50-50 split between them two as one entity and then you as another. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, I get it. Um, we, we won't go yeah. too far into that. Um, <laughs> we're running out of time. I want to respect your time. But we do have some other questions about your BeatStars strategy. How many beats do you upload to your BeatStars page a week? Honestly, I used to have a method. I don't really have a method now because I've been doing a lot of different things. So I haven't been making as many beats as I used to. So when now what I do is I'll upload like two beats every time my previous beats get like a good amount of plays, like over 100 plays. And then I just upload like two new beats. And then I wait for those two new beats to get 100 plays. And then I upload two more. That's just really all I do. Okay, that's interesting. And I've actually thought about doing that where I think, God, am I, am I putting too many beats up if my previous ones haven't really had time to breathe yet? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's interesting. Um, what are some of the strategies that are at the core of your online beat marketing business? Um, honestly, I make a lot of money from just posting snippets on Instagram. So that's one of the main things that I used to do. Well, I'm trying to start back doing that. But like, I don't really put my beats on YouTube like that anymore. I want to get back into it. So I don't really have like a whole bunch of online strategies, honestly. I'm not the type of person. I'm not going to sit here and lie. So I don't really have a lot. But most of my, my money just comes from my Instagram, as crazy as it sounds. I don't think that's crazy, but how did you get to the point where <laughs> your Instagram posts are targeting the right audience? Well, how did it happen? Okay, so this this musical blog or whatever, they have like a million followers. So they used to post my videos of me like cooking up or whatever. And so there's like a whole bunch of artists who followed that page. So when they would post me, those artists, some of those artists will follow me on my Instagram. And that's how I have this audience of like rappers instead of like a whole bunch of producers following me. Because I think that's the key. A lot of producers follow other producers. You know, mm -hmm. we're... Uh for all, for all the <laughs> negative points that we touched on, we are a pretty supportive community when it comes to following each other and mm -hmm. engaging with, with one another's posts. But the problem with that is we don't buy each other's beats. Right. So that's always kind of an issue. You know, even for me, when I post stuff to YouTube, probably a lot, if not most of the comments are from other producers, which I appreciate. Um, I, I think maybe the rappers are a little less vocal in the comment section. But I, I guess for you, are you producing, are you deliberately posting content that is specifically tailored to what you think a rapper would want to see? Mm -hmm. Like that's the easy, yes. I, I used to do that. Like I used to post, cause like right now I don't really post like a whole bunch of snippets like that no more, but like, um, 
I want to say like two months ago, I would post like five beats, five snippets of beats. Like, and I, I like everything I do is strategic. Like when I would post my beat snippets, I'd make sure that they're long enough so you can hear like what sections of the beat, how it's going, like the hook, the verse or whatever. So I post, but not, like, like not too long. Like I would post them for like 45 seconds or whatever. And the type of beats I was post, I would post were very specific. Like I know the type of people that were following me. I know that they like pain beats. So I'd make sure that I had at least two pain beats. Um, what else? And then like the, a little baby type beat. And then, and then like two other hard trap beats. So that was my strategy back then. But I don't really make those kinds of beats now. So now what I do is just more so like, well, sometimes I'll still post like a little baby type beat, a pain beat. And then like, I'll post something that's kind of like different, like off the wall, like not so usual. And then I'll post something like with a guitar or something like, I don't know. It just depends now. Like really, I just, I still do the same thing, but not like really. I just do me now. But yeah, that's what I used to do back then. Yeah, I think, I think strategies change a lot. I mean, mm-hmm. certain producers have kind of stuck to one strategy their whole careers and it really works for them. So those are the people that I'm jealous of. Um, last question, because I <laughs> should we were supposed to end four minutes ago. There are a lot of people still in here, um, oh which God. I knew would happen. But so shout out to DJ Name. He's one of those people that's been in here throughout. Um, what kind of sounds are you looking for when people send you loops? Really? Um, I'm pretty versatile when it comes to like making beats. Like, okay, when it comes to making trap beats, I'm pretty versatile. Like, I can make like any kind of trap beat. I don't care really more so of how specific the loop sounds. Um, really, what I look for is just does it sound good? Does it inspire me to want to make a beat? Also, I look for stuff that's like that has sections. Like, I don't really like when people send me eight bar loops because nine times out of ten, I won't use it because I won't get that much inspiration from it. So with loops now, I look for like, okay, does it have like a little intro section, a hook section, and a verse section? That's really it. Oh, and also, this is a really important thing. Also, is the loop, like, spaced out to where... I don't really like when people send me stems for loops, but are the stems kind of at the end of the loop? Like, each sound at the end of the loop. That's something I like. What do you mean by that? Like, let's say someone sends me a pain loop or whatever with, like, a piano, guitar, and, like, a vocal chop. So, like, at the end of the loop, I would like for that person to put a section where it's just the piano by itself, and then the guitar by itself, and then the vocal by itself. Okay, yeah, yeah. So break down each individual part. Right. Okay, yeah, that's that's very good to know. Um, didn't feel like over an hour, so that that is a good sign. Um, thanks for sharing all of your insight and, and your <laughs> very honest experiences in the music business. Uh, one more time, how can people follow you and check out your beats? Um... Instagram Monique Winning, Twitter Monique Winning underscore, and my beat stars is Monique Winning.